Hello again, everyone. In this, the second part of lecture 18, we are going to be talking about the central limit theorem. This is the most important theorem that we discuss in this class. It is arguably among the most important theorems in mathematics. Certainly, I would say the most important theorem in statistics, though perhaps you could find somebody to argue with me on that point. I'm inclined to doubt it. So the central limit theorem is a huge deal and it is why the normal random variable is of such central importance. So we will lead into it a little bit here, thinking about how it relates to the law of large numbers. We'll state the theorem formally. We'll think about the intuition, about what it means, how to interpret the theorem. We'll look at some examples. We'll look at sort of some broad sort of examples. So we'll look at some very abstract kinds of examples and then we'll look at some more concrete examples as well to get a handle on what this theorem is telling us. So we just concluded our discussion of the law of large numbers and that says that if you have a large sample size you expect your sample mean to be close to your population mean. But it doesn't surprise us if the sample mean is not exactly equal to the population mean. There are many times that your sample mean will be off from the population mean a bit. In the last, the first part of this lecture, the last discussion that we had, we said that you could flip a coin seven times, see four heads out of seven flips, and get your sample mean to be four over seven. That's not exactly one half, but that's reasonable. And it also wouldn't be surprising to flip a coin a thousand times and see 501 heads if it's a fair coin. That's not exactly the population mean, but it's close to the population mean, and it's not surprising. It would be surprising to flip a fair coin a thousand times and see 999 heads. So some values for the sample mean seem more likely to us than other values for the sample mean. If you have a large sample size and if you assume that your coin is fair. The central limit theorem is telling us exactly how the sample mean is distributed around the population mean. So it's worth noting here that sample mean is a random quantity. We're going to say this again. But the sample mean for your observation depends on the values that you actually observe. If I flip a coin a thousand times and get a thousand a string of zeros and ones that's of length 1,000, the sample mean is going to depend on exactly which string of zeros and ones I end up observing. So I could take a sample of size 1,000 and calculate a sample mean. I could then take another sample of size 1000, calculate a sample mean for that new sample, and it would likely be different from the mean that I saw for my first thousand observations. Because the actual observations that you make are random, the sample is a random object, it is actually a random vector if we wanted to be precise, and the sample mean is going to be a random quantity based on that random sample. The central limit theorem is telling us the distribution of this new aggregate random variable sample mean. So sample mean, we know that it's going to likely be close to population mean, especially for large sample size. But what is the probability distribution? What is the density function that tells us how likely sample mean is to show up in different regions? That's given by the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us if you have a population, and it's got population mean mu, so these two are the same setup as we had in the law of large numbers. But we have to add this third condition that says that the variance is finite. I'll say more about that in just a moment. But if we have a population with population mean mu, population variance is sigma squared, which is finite, then sample mean is approximately a normal random variable with mean mu, the population mean, and the variance of sample mean is going to be sigma squared over n. So this is our actual population variance divided by the sample size to give us the variance of the sample mean. And this is going to be true for large n. In particular, and I'll try to remember to write this in the notes as well, but as a general rule of thumb, n greater than 40 is a pretty safe bet. So if n is bigger than 40, if you have at least 40 elements in your sample size, then this is a good approximation. Xn is pretty close to being a normal with this mean and this variance. So there do exist random variables with infinite variance that can intuitively, you might think, well, the values are spread out infinitely much or something like that. It's not quite that. It just has to do with the way that variance is defined as an integral. Variance is an expected value of the square of the difference between the observed value and the, the mean for the population or for that random variable.
and that expected value is an integral for continuous random variables or a sum for discrete random variables, that integral or sum need not converge. So you can have perfectly good random variables that are reasonable, that you can talk about, that do have real world applications, but because that sum or variance does not, con I'm sorry, that sum or integral that is variance does not actually converge to a finite number, you end up with infinite variance random variables. We haven't discussed any such in this course and we're not going to, but they do exist. And I generally want to be very explicit about the limitations of the theorems that we study. The central limit theorem is famously applicable over a very wide swath of random variables. So one thing that we're gonna talk more about and that's so important about it is how universal this theorem is. There are a few limitations on it in terms of which random variables and which populations it applies to. But bullet point three here is one such limitation. You do need finite variance for your population. Beyond that, all bets are off. Almost any kind of random variable will work as long as it satisfies this one not terribly restrictive condition of finite variance. So bear that in mind. And we're gonna say more about this, but this is a random variable. There are different likelihoods that it shows up in different places. Those likelihoods are gonna be given by, at least in an approximate way, by a density function for a normal with these two parameter values. So intuitively, the law of large numbers tells us that the sample mean converges to the population mean as n goes to infinity. That's simple enough to state. The central limit theorem tells us that, the, that xn hat, the sample mean, it is a random quantity and it is going to fall randomly <clears throat> about mu or around mu in a almost normal way. So in a way that is typical of a normal random variable. So we're gonna draw some density functions here with n small. This is what the density function might look like. With n large, that sigma squared over n term gets smaller when n is large, and so the density function becomes one of the taller and pointier density functions when n is large. Well, let's take these in turn. For n small, our sigma squared over n is relatively large. And so we're looking at a density function for a normal, which is a lower or a higher, rather, variance density function. And I've got mu right here in the middle. Mu was the mean for the normal described by the central limit theorem. And so if I want to know what's the likelihood that xn hat shows up near, near mu, it would be the area under the curve near mu. So I've taken an interval that contains mu. I want the probability that xn hat shows up in that interval, and that's gonna be given by the integral of the density function for this normal over that interval. At least that will be approximately the probability that we're talking about. So the probability that my sample mean falls in this interval is relatively large. The interval from this left-hand endpoint to this right-hand endpoint here on the horizontal axis. So xn hat is likely to show up over here near mu. It's less likely to show up over here far away from mu. The central limit theorem is telling us that xn hat sample mean is approximately normally distributed around mu. So the likelihood of xn hat showing up in different regions can be given by a density function for a normal random variable, at least approximately. So xn hat is likely to show up here near mu it is less likely to show up over here far away from mu. If we increase the sample size so that the variance of xn hat gets smaller, it being sigma squared over n, then we're gonna see a taller and skinnier normal density function around mu. Now it's even more likely that my sample mean shows up near mu because more of the total probabilistic mass of one has been concentrated near the mean mu here. So now the likelihood that my sample mean shows up near mu is even larger than it was before, larger. And the probability that my sample mean shows up way over here is even smaller than it was previously. So for a larger sample size, it becomes more likely that your sample mean shows up near the population mean and less likely that your sample mean shows up far away from the population mean. Just as our intuition would suggest, and this is in accord with what is stated by the law of large numbers. The law of large numbers just tells us that sample mean converges to population mean. The central limit theorem tells us exactly how that happens. It actually gives us the distribution of the 
sample mean about the population mean. And further, it shows that the variance of that distribution decreases for larger sample sizes. So they, they say similar things. The central limit theorem gives us more information than the law of large numbers does, though. We like thinking about the law of large numbers because it's easy to state and because it gets us thinking about sample mean and it gets us thinking about sample mean getting closer to population mean. But the central limit theorem tells us exactly how sample mean is distributed about population mean for a large sample size. So, as we said a moment ago, it's, it's important to note that sample mean is a random variable. Its value is random and it depends on your observations. The central limit theorem gives us the distribution or the approximate density function associated with this aggregate random variable sample mean. <clears throat> the second thing to note, which we've already been talking about a bit, is that the variance of sample mean is approximately sigma squared over n. So sigma squared is the population mean, I'm sorry, the population variance, the variance associated with each of the random variables in our population. And so the, the more variance there is in your population, the more variance you're gonna see in sample mean. But the variance associated with the sample mean is actually gonna decrease as the sample size increases. So as n gets larger, the variance associated with sample mean gets smaller, meaning that it becomes less likely that you see your sample mean differ from the population mean by any significant amount. And a third point to make is that all of this, the central limit theorem, is of such a central importance because we did not impose much restriction upon which type of population it could apply to. We could have been dealing with a Bernoulli population. We could have been dealing with a binomial population. Each of our random variables in our population might have already been normal. They could have been something called a Poisson random variable, which we haven't talked about in this class. They could have been beta, they could have been gamma, they could have been geometric or exponential. There's a ton of different types of random variables. We've only considered a few, but any of those different types of random variables, the central limit theorem applies to them. So as long as your population variance is finite, you can have any type of population from a vast array of different types of populations, and you'll always have the sample mean being approximately normal. So no matter what type of population you begin with, if you begin with a Bernoulli, if you begin with an exponential, if you begin with a Poisson population, your sample mean always comes back to being a normal random variable. This is why normal random variables are so important. This is why they show up all over the place. This is why bell curves show up all over the place. Is because no matter what type of population you begin with, as long as it has finite variance, the sample mean will be normally distributed, or I should say approximately normally distributed about the true mean. So this is the crux of the issue. This is why the study of such diverse phenomena can be brought back mathematically and statistically to a study of a normal random variable. You can begin with any type of population, but the sample mean will be essentially normal. And so translating from just a, a myriad of different diverse and wild and wily, just crazy different stuff, it, it all pulls back to a study of the normal random variable via the central limit theorem. This is essentially why bell curves show up everywhere, because there was no limitation in place in the central limit theorem upon what type of population you began with. You begin, can begin with populations of any type, as long as the variance is finite, your sample mean is approximately normal. So hitting that, hitting that point over and over again because it's important and I definitely want you to be thinking about that. We have also noted here that the fact that the variance associated with your sample mean goes to zero as n goes to infinity, that means that for larger values of n, your sample mean is more likely to show up close to your population mean. The variance gets smaller as n gets larger, so you do not expect the sample mean to vary by much from the population mean for a large sample size. If you want to use your sample mean as an estimate for the population mean, which seems like a fully reasonable thing to do, then you're going to prefer to have larger sample sizes. Your sample mean is going to be a better estimate of population mean for a larger sample size. If I'm trying to build a spaceship and I'm thinking about buying bolts from some supplier, 
I want to know the average mass of the bolts they're providing with me because I have to be thrifty with mass in my design of a spaceship. If I buy a box of 10 bolts and I mass each of those and I take the average, the sample mean, for that sample of size 10, I could use that as an approximation for the true population mean, but it would be better if I bought a thousand bolts and massed each of those and found the sample mean associated with that sample of size 1000. I can use that for an estimator for the actual population mean, and I can know that the variance associated with that new estimator is actually smaller than the variance associated with the estimator built from a sample of size 10. So we are going to talk just briefly about this broader topic of point estimation of population parameters. We're going to give it about half a day. That'll probably actually be our next lecture, which is tomorrow, because today this is a weird week where we have an extra class meeting this week. But we'll move quickly from that. We have some more important and complex ideas that we want to give ample time to. But there is a concept, or there is a topic, point estimation of population parameters, where you think about using different statistics, different numbers that can be computed from a sample, to estimate population parameters, parameters associated with your population. And the most famous example, and the only one that we'll really, or one of the only ones we'll touch on, is the use of sample mean as an estimator for population mean. And one thing we can see at this point is that the central limit theorem tells us that the variance associated with the sample mean decreases for larger sample size. So that larger sample size sample means are going to make better estimators for the population mean. Which makes good intuitive sense. So now we're going to discuss the topic of the central limit theorem and how it relates to the concept of standardization for normal random variables. So the central limit theorem tells us that the sample mean is approximately normal with mm, mean equal to population mean mu and variance equal to the ratio of population variance sigma squared and sample size n. So looking at that, that tells us right away that the expected value of sample mean is approximately mu the variance of sample mean is approximately the sigma squared over n term, which means the standard deviation associated with sample mean is going to be population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. That's me just taking the expression for variance and square rooting it. So if I've got mean and I've got standard deviation, xn hat is approximately a normal of this type. If I subtract off its mean and I divide by its standard deviation, that should leave me with approximately a normal, a standard normal random variable. So we saw that for any normal random variable, you could subtract off its mean and you could divide by its standard deviation, and that would give you a norm, a standard normal random variable. This was the concept of standardization that we discussed as we talked about normal random variables. That might have been the last lecture that we had. So. If xn is approximately such a normal, and I perform the same process, I should get something which is approximately a standard normal. And that's what we're doing here exactly. So the left-hand side of this boxed equation looks a lot like the expression for standardization, except the denominator is sigma over root n, because sigma here is population standard deviation. Sigma over root n is the standard deviation associated with this random variable sample mean. That's what this line here says. So we're still doing the same thing, it's just that we have a slightly more complicated expression for standard deviation than we did when we were discussing the process of standardization. But this is approximately a standard normal, and I can now calculate probabilities for this expression using my chart phi. I'm only going to get approximately correct solutions, but for large sample size these approximations are very good and so it is a useful tool despite not being an exact answer. When you start working in, especially for engineers, but even for people working in the sciences or the social sciences like education, there is, there are many approximations that are made. There are a few exact answers and instead many approximations are made, but if you can guarantee that they're good approximations, and better still, if you can express explicitly how good of an approximation they are, then it suffices. So let's make use of this. Let's consider an example here. So let's flip a fair coin 10 to the 3 times, 1,000 coin flips. We are going to use the central limit theorem to estimate the likelihood of seeing between 490 and 510 heads in these 1,000 coin flips. And it seems like that should be fairly likely. 
Like, it wouldn't really surprise me to see fewer or more heads in a thousand flips than this, but it does seem like there should be a substantial likelihood of seeing between 490 and 510 heads in a thousand fair coin flips. So, let's use the central limit theorem to estimate this likelihood. So, we have not been asked to articulate a population. We have not been asked explicitly what does the population mean or what is the sample here, but I am going to lay all of that out because it helps me to organize my thoughts and it helps me to translate the word problem into more actionable mathematics. So many times you will get problems of this type. Maybe you can jump right in without doing some of this preliminary setup work, but especially as you're just learning this material, and certainly if you're having any trouble at all with this material, if you're not in danger of getting a perfect in the class already, I definitely recommend that you lay out the setup explicitly in this way. So it need not be explicitly asked for, but developing this sort of preliminary machinery or, or setting the stage in a formal way can definitely help you to proceed through the problem. So we got a fair coin, we're gonna flip it a bunch of times. I could create a IID population which represents all the coin flips that could ever occur with this coin. This is a Bernoulli one-half population because each of these is a Bernoulli and because it's a fair coin, the parameter associated with these Bernoullis is one-half. So x1 is the result of the first coin flip, x2 is the result of the second coin flip, and so forth. Each of these being a Bernoulli one-half random variable. My population mean here is the mean of each of those, which is one-half. For a Bernoulli of this type, the expected value or the mean is just the parameter value one-half. Also I know the population variance, sigma squared, is going to be p times one minus p, giving me one-fourth for this fair coin Bernoulli population. We did not explicitly define population variance, but it is the variance associated with each of the random variables that make up the population. So it has got an exactly analogous definition to population mean. And then there will be a sample, a finite sample drawn from this population. It's gonna be a sample of size 1,000. And it represents the first 1,000 coin flips that we could make and observe. In here being sample size, which is 1,000. These are Bernoulli random variables, so each of them takes value zero or one, and if I want the number of heads, I can actually sum up this, the values of these first thousand random variables to get the number of heads. So do try to convince yourself of this. We've worked with this trick in the past, but it's the number of successes in a thousand Bernoulli trials is just the sum of those 1,000 Bernoulli random variables. For every xi that comes up tails, I'm gonna write down a zero so that I don't increment the sum at all. And every coin flip that comes up heads, I'm gonna write down a one so I do increment and I count that flip as a heads. So do convince yourself for a few simple examples if you need to, like write out some results for what if you flipped the coin five times and the zeros and ones that you would see and convince yourself that by summing up those values, you do actually get the number of heads that occurred and that number of coin flips. If we have this in place, we can now articulate the probability we've been asked to find is the probability that 490 is less than or equal to the number of heads, which is given by the sum, which is then less than or equal to 510. This is a C in between 490 and 510, where I've interpreted it to be inclusive here in 1,000 coin flips, seeing that many heads between 490 and 510 heads in 1,000 coin flips. So this is what we're looking for. This is the probability I have to find. I've been told to approximate this using the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is telling me something about the distribution of the sample mean. So rather than dealing with this sum of the xi's, I would like to be dealing with xi x sub 1000 hat, the sample mean for a sample of size 1000. So it's easy to get from this sum to the sample mean. I just need to divide by the number of summands here. So I'm going to divide by 1,000. And I need to do the same thing to the left and to the right if I'm doing it to the center here. That then simplifies to the sample mean for a sample of size 1,000. That's exactly what this expression is. And I can simplify the left and the right to these decimal expressions. I'm now going to, so the Central limit theorem tells me that this sample mean is approximately normal. I want to standardize it to get it to be approximately a standard normal. So I'm going to subtract off the mean value associated with this random variable, which is actually the population mean, one half, 
and then I'm going to divide by the standard deviation of this random variable, which is actually population standard deviation, square root of 0.25, divided by the square root of the sample size, 10 to the 3 end of the root. So this is my sigma squared over n, and I'm taking the square root of that to give me the standard deviation of this random variable. So I've got sample mean minus mu divided by sigma over root n, where I've actually written that as sigma squared over n, all under the square root here. And if I'm gonna subtract off the 0.5 and divide by this radical term in the middle, I have to do the same to the left and to the right. So everything that I've done here so far has been exact. This is where I'm making an approximation. So this is the first place I use my wavy approximation signs. And it's because this middle expression is approximately a standard normal. So going from this ratio, sample mean minus mu over square root of sigma squared over n, going from that to z is where I'm making an approximation. And I'm making that approximation via the central limit theorem. So I indicate here that this is approximately equal to this expression because of the central limit theorem. And I also can calculate what's going on on the left and what's going on on the right, and they come out to be negative 0.63 and 0.63 respectively. So I may give you problems where I say, here's a probability I want you to find. Use the central limit theorem to find an approximate value for this probability. Be explicit about where you make an approximation using the central limit theorem. And this would be a good way to make explicit such an, uh, where you're making such an approximation. So go through a bunch of equal signs first, and then there should be an approximate sign here where you're actually replacing this expression with z. And then you can note that that approximation is because of the central limit theorem. That's the kind of thing I would be looking for if I ask you to find such a probability approximately and to be explicit about where an approximation is made using the central limit theorem. And at this point, we can compute our probability in terms of phi. The probability that z lands between negative 0.63 and 0.63 is going to be the phi at 0.63 minus phi at negative 0.63. You can look those values up on your chart, and you get this number for the difference there. So there's about a 47% chance, or almost a 1 in 2 chance, almost a half and half, almost 50-50 odds the number of heads is between 490 and 510 in a thousand flips of a fair coin. And that seems reasonable. I might have even guessed it was a little bit higher than that. The, the values between 490 and 510 have to be the most likely values for the number of heads. But there's so many possible values that they make up 47% of the total likelihood of all possible outcomes. All right, let's have a sample problem related to this. So for the above situation, so the same fair coin, flipping it the same thousand times, find the probability that the number of heads is greater than 600. So what's the likelihood of seeing 601 or more heads in a thousand flips of a fair coin? And I want you to use the central limit theorem to estimate this probability. These coin flips, these number of heads in multiple flips of a fair coin, these probabilities could actually be computed explicitly using the binomial random variable. The binomial does give you the number of successes in multiple Bernoulli trials. So we could call the number of heads a binomial with parameters 1,000 and 1 half for N and P respectively. And then talk about the probability that that random variable is greater than or equal to 601. And you would have a sum of a bunch of different probabilities but it would be difficult to calculate explicitly. You'd have to be adding the probability that that binomial was equal to 601 plus the probability that it was equal to 602, all the way up to and including the probability that it was equal to 1,000. And so that's annoying. And I've told you explicitly here to not use a binomial model, but instead use the central limit theorem to get an approximate value for this probability. So go ahead and pause the video and give that some thought. The example that we just did should be a excellent guide for how to proceed here. All right, you have had time to pause the video, so let's take a look at this solution. We got the same setup, the same population, same population mean, same population variance, same sample. Now we want the number of heads here, given by this sum, to be greater than 600. We want the likelihood of that event occurring. So as before, 
I want to use the central limit theorem, so I need to get an expression that involves my sample mean. So I'm going to divide both of these by a thousand. That makes the sum divided by the number of sum ends, the sample mean, and this just simplifies to the numerical value of 0.6. Now, I want to use the central limit theorem, so I'm gonna subtract the mean of this random variable, sample mean. I'm gonna subtract its expected value. I'm gonna divide by the square root of sigma squared over n, and I'm gonna do that to the right and the left here to get these two expressions. This one is approximately z, and this one comes out to be about 6.32 here. So an approximation is being made at that point as I am transitioning from this expression to z, and that approximation is via the central limit theorem. The probability that z is greater than 6.32 is gonna be one minus the probability that z is less than or equal to 6.32, and the probability that z is less than or equal to 6.32 is phi of 6.32. 6.32 is way off your chart, so we can just say that phi at that value is approximately one, and so we're getting one minus one, which is basically zero. There is within the error tolerance of this example, essentially no chance of seeing 601 or more coins, uh, flips come up heads out of these thousand coin flips. It's vanishingly improbable. There is in fact a finite probability of that event occurring, but it's small enough that it didn't even register on our chart, and so we represented this being approximately zero here. So, there's something else I wanted to say momentarily. Well, if there was, we'll have to come back to it. Hopefully that makes some sense. We will next move in to our three final topics, one of which is gonna be much abbreviated. These are point estimation of parameters, which is gonna be abbreviated. Then we'll think about confidence intervals. And finally, we'll spend the most of the remainder of our time together thinking about statistical tests of hypotheses. This is the kind of work that statisticians actually do in the world, and we're going to give it due consideration. So thank you, folks. I will talk to you again shortly.